So, uh, hello everyone uh, and welcome uh, to another webinar uh, within the uh, project Child Education in Central Asia, uh, titled International Training Program on uh, Medical Training and Education in Digital Era Perspectives and Challenges. Uh, this is the training program for postgraduate uh, uh, participants uh, who are dealing with the medical training and education uh, and would like to improve uh, their skills and knowledge uh, in use of digital technologies for uh, modern uh, medical training and education. Today, we are at, with the last uh, of the webinars uh, within uh, these training programs. Just briefly, the Child uh, Central Asia project uh, has aimed to support modernization, professionalization and internationalization of postgraduate training in eight universities of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan in field of pediatric, pediatric surgery and child neuropsychiatry. Also, these uh, webinars are organized in collaboration with European Distance and E-Learning Network. Just allow me to briefly say that this year we are celebrating 30 years of serving modernization in education in Europe. And we are very happy to be able to continuously share knowledge and improve understanding among professionals in distance and e-learning and to promote policy and practice across whole Europe and beyond. The title of today web, today's webinar is Collaborative Online Trusted Relationships for Multicultural, Multicultural Exchange. The issue of uh, um, virtual mobility and virtual exchange is not, not new. Uh, it's definitely present uh, for a number of years, but maybe we can say that pandemic has fostered uh, uh, these two uh, possibilities on a higher level uh, than before. And uh, internationalization uh, is something definitely which is important for all, uh, high, uh, for all education institutions. Um, today we have experts who will talk uh, about uh, this uh, 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 and give their expertise and practice on this topic. I can only say that maybe um, uh, uh, internalization uh, and the virtual mobility has been um, given the, the, the positive wind and push uh, actually with pandemic, uh, which served uh, as a kind of catalyst uh, for their improvement uh, and, uh, uh, and wider, uh, wider uh, presence. And today's speakers, we have Irina Volungevicene, President of Eden Digital Europe, Director of Institute for Study Innovation at Vitatus Magnus Universities in Lithuania. We have Elena Caldirola, Director of E-Learning Center of University Pavia in Italy. We have Francesca Helm, Researcher at the Department of Politics, Law and International Studies at the University of Padova in Italy and Wim van Petegen, professor at uh, Leuven Belgium and also from Belgium and also editor-in-chief of EURODL, uh, uh, the uh, research uh, 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 publication, which is uh, in the field uh, of, uh, uh, Europe, in, you know, of distance learning and also uh, part of the EDEN. So um, I wish to thank uh, my uh, speakers today uh, I'm, I will stop sharing my presentation and uh, each of them will have an uh, introductionary, uh, uh, introductionary session. Uh, so now I'm inviting first uh, Irina uh, to start uh, and you can share your screen. So Irina, please. Dear colleagues, uh, dear participants of this uh, webinar, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to discuss today with you uh, the topic of virtual mobility and internationalization. Actually, two very important uh, topics for research and practice that uh, opened uh, in a new context, in a new uh, paradigm, and are going through the shift. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is, of course, uh, the last two years uh, working online, but at the same time, the potential that uh, higher education institutions uh, see 
for international interinstitutional collaboration. I will start uh, my short presentation uh, uh, to share with you uh, the research that has been going on uh, about the concept of virtual mobility. It is a not a new concept, as you may see. Uh, researchers uh, from different countries and even uh, regions of the world starting discussing it, but Europe here has a say and uh, has many publications and uh, research books and case studies dedicated to the important area uh, that uh, was identified uh, already in the beginning of uh, this um, uh, century. It would be interesting to note that here we have um, uh, Professor Wim van Vietegem uh, from KU Leuven, uh, the university uh, among the pioneers of this research. Also, uh, we had um, dissertations uh, published in our university uh, about the developments, the formats, the potential and the impact of virtual mobility upon students, teachers, a curriculum and institutions. I will come back about this uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, I decided to share with you a couple of um, uh, short, uh, very short cases, and then to talk with you about the impact of virtual mobility uh, that uh, actually was proved through research implemented, I would say, in the last um, 10, uh, 11 years. Uh, I really prefer myself and share with you uh, the proposal of uh, the definition of virtual and blended mobility suggested initially by the European Commission in 2011 you see the reference document, but then adapted and approved by this consortia of institutions uh, with logos that you see in the slides, with whom we had the pleasure to collaborate on the European projects about virtual mobility uh, development and implementation. And definition says that in this case, it is set of information and communication technology supported activities organized at institutional level that realize or facilitate international collaborative experiences in a context of teaching and or learning with the hint that sometimes it may go uh, only in a non-formal or even informal way. We, of course, uh, established uh, our characteristics of virtual mobility and we characterized it uh, from the perspective of the number of involved actors in the process. So uh, virtual mobility opens possibilities to co for collaboration of more than two uh, ed higher education institutions. We, we focused on higher education because in physical, our traditional, if we may call it the mobility, usually a person travels from one country to another country and this is based on bilateral uh, agreement between two higher education institutions so definitely virtual mobility expands it teachers and um, and students uh, as well uh, experience uh, enhancement and facilitation. And uh, I will give you short examples. When students staying in one country and being in their home universities in the same semester uh, participate in uh, uh, via virtual mobility way in two or even three uh, universities at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my uh, initial examples will be focusing on three types of um, virtual mobility, multilateral collaboration in formal studies, multilateral collaboration in non-formal studies, and bilateral collaboration in formal studies. The first is most complex, and the last one is the simplest, and maybe the second step uh, to be mainstreamed in Europe. So I will start with the first, that was one of the most complicated cases that I was involved in, when uh, actually three higher education institutions uh, agreed to develop one formal uh, learning course for bachelor study program, and 13 teachers from six higher education institutions 
develop one course. The first challenge is uh, when you start such, uh, I would say, really <laughs> multilateral collaboration in formal settings is agreement on the learning outcomes. Uh, if um, I could give you an example, it would be the stable when uh, six uh, higher education institutions divide uh, curriculum into equal parts, uh, following, of course, uh, learning outcome and assessment strategy, and uh, share uh, development of learning design and learning curriculum uh, in the format of submodules or topics, and then accompany the same group of students that could be, of course, uh, by nature international, through one semester in one course. You can imagine such rich experience and it is existent and it is quite a successful example. That happened a long time ago when we had still old audience type video conferences, meeting students every Friday from group uh, groups of uh, national um, participants, and then uh, working in an asynchronous way in Moodle. Testimonies and impact of such experiences show that it's great pleasure uh, for students to enrich, to in enhance their academic exchange and also social cultural exchange. A similar uh, project was carried on when, um, again, um, four universities in this case developed a study program, a study program consisting of uh, uh, 10 or 11 uh, modules together, again, in multilateral collaboration. And uh, this collaboration proved such a huge impact that teachers and students appreciated collaborative uh, mode in curriculum designing, in virtual mobility studies, and in the end, all universities benefited from uh, the whole list of modules developed together. So each university receives a new updated uh, master program. And of course, it continues in different, different ways and modalities in meetings, uh, visits, uh, and other social, cultural, and academic exchange. This is an evident, evident result of such case studies. The second type of multilateral collaboration in non-formal studies uh, is an easier format where uh, people meet in projects usually, develop a joint course together, uh, again, uh, inviting uh, several universities, uh, uh, even from outside consortium, uh, to participate in course development. And then, uh, of course, uh, pilot the courses and issue certificates as non-formal uh, course certificates for uh, the participants of the course. I know uh, that I can be confident showing here the names and, and signatures of people involved because that was very, very uh, favorable experience as well. However, each such experience of collaborative international, colla collaboration in international settings has much wider impact like experience gained, lessons learned, uh, feedback, uh, testimonies, uh, trusted network development, and what is more important, understanding uh, what are the steps needed for higher education institution to prepare for the quality integrated uh, virtual mobility processes. Uh, that are needed and uh, uh, how to prepare internal regulations that such virtual mobility could be implemented. And uh, as I promised, uh, the third uh, most uh, probably popular uh, way awaiting uh, Europe uh, in the coming years is bilateral collaboration in formal studies when traditional physical mobility can be uh, not replaced, but enriched by virtual mobility options. When a, a single university offers courses for students all over the world and in Europe 
to participate in an exchange program, to join their courses, but the courses are not um, uh, developed uh, in a collaborative way. I would say it's a loss, uh, but maybe the first accurate step towards virtual mobility implementation. The problems and barriers for virtual mobility are still numerous. One of them is that still virtual mobility is not funded enough and properly, but to my knowledge, uh, regulations are being updated and Europe already takes care and discusses how the process uh, should be uh, funded. And then, of course, uh, in the preparedness of the institutions, those who do not yet have experience. And the very last slides uh, uh, will tell you uh, a couple of statements. I will share with you a couple of statements about how virtual mobility actually contributes to international collaboration. And all these statements have been reached through research implemented um, in uh, quantitative and qualitative research uh, after uh, the experiences uh, that I shared with you before. So there is data uh, which uh, is evidence that a virtual mobility as international uh, collaboration experience enhances internationalization of studies, expands learning environments, contributes to cultural intercultural exchange, encourages good practices, collaboration, even idea sharing, it establishes interinstitutional trust-based relationships and solves problems of time, distance, and sometimes financial resources. Virtual mobility has impact for higher education institutions. I am not going to read all these uh, bullet points, but um, uh, all benefit, benefits listed here actually directly support internationalization and modernization of higher education as such. Virtual mobility has impact for teachers uh, on the level of professional development, networking, exchange, uh, and of course, um, transparency, recognition of teaching and professionalization, career opportunities, even research enhancement. Um, and uh, virtual mobility, of course, uh, has benefits for students. This should come first, but we know that first institutions need to prepare, then teachers need to prepare curriculum, and then students receive uh, the outcome of this preparation already. So students who participated in research, in quantitative research, uh, indicated that they upgraded their transferable skills participating in virtual mobility. Also, they uh, confirmed curriculum and study quality enhancement experiences, new learning methods suggested by various higher education institutions, transparency of learning, enhanced employability, intercultural international experience and expertise, enlarged academic areas of studies, new possibilities, of course, and uh, support for um, being home students and lifelong learning groups, international study accessibility for physical and social economically disadvantaged groups. So this is my short introduction. And of course, uh, I will be happy to discuss it further with you. Thank you, Irina. You have very nicely uh, shared uh, uh, what actually uh, this is about and these three uh, possibilities. Uh, I think now uh, it's quite clear uh, on, on the benefits of, of all this. I invite uh, participants to, to set the question in the chat or their experience. But uh, before we are going forward, the, the question for you, um, Actually, uh, from your uh, experience, uh, how much students are interested in participating in such programs in, uh, developed uh, jointly by uh, more universities uh, and in, in, in individual mobility as, as such? Uh, definitely with pandemic, we have experienced that uh, uh, the European Commission has said that blended mobility is possible because usually students went physically uh, to some university 
is uh, for for one semester to to get some new knowledge. Now we see that uh, as it was not possible, more and more virtual mobility is uh, present. And also uh, the European Commission is encouraging the the uh, collaboration of multiple universities uh, uh, jointly uh, to work uh, on some programs. So. Um, your experience from your students and how you see this in the future, how it will expand? We actually, in our university, worked a lot to explain to students and teachers what they may expect, uh, what kind of support they will receive if they choose a course in a different university and enroll. And... Uh, if their learning outcomes will be recognized and how uh, how they will be visible in their academic certificate. So we worked a lot with our students and we sent out many, many students to our partner universities. I think we were among the leaders uh, sending students outside and we see it as a very beneficial way uh, because students are very eager to know about different ways of uh, studies in, in different countries. Um, by, you know, we, we are eager to find out uh, some, something that is new, something that is different, and maybe we find better um, offers in, in different countries, in different universities, and we want to try. Uh, so their experience was very positive. And when we had next round and next round, they were happy. They were already peer learning from each other and registered for virtual mobility. But you have to explain and to work with your students very, uh, I think, um, very openly, preparing them for this new experience. It might, in my opinion, it's a very good way for students to test, to pilot studies in a different university before physical visit to that university or that country. And the same with teachers. Uh, teachers um, enjoy working together, but they need time to understand, to accommodate themselves. I think we need to work a lot in order to prepare them and to explain. Thank you. Let's move on and then we will come back uh, for discussion. Uh, so, uh, our next speaker is Elena Calderola. So, Elena, please, uh, can you share uh, uh, your uh, part of introduction uh, now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and uh, thank you very much, Irina, for a really uh, interesting and insight uh, view and framework for uh, virtual mobility, talking about uh, some projects in which uh, Irina and other people were uh, play a um, paramount uh, role uh, in order to um, uh, produce the, and release the, them in, a, in a Europe. And uh, together with her, I was with my university participating, uh, in a, especially in one project and other initiatives. And this one project I want to present today in depth. One of the projects that mentioned Irina, that is opening university for virtual mobility. And now this is, will be the topic of my presentation. I'm going to share my slide. So while Irina, uh, with practical example for sure, but uh, also uh, gave us uh, theoretical frames about uh, the various uh, types of uh, visual mobility, I want to focus on a, a specific uh, project. And uh, it was a joke just to say visual mobility at work. So uh, we can check, we can control how was going a project uh, the positive part, uh, the trouble in this project, and the lesson learned at the end of this project. So uh, the project, uh, uh, the title of this project was uh, Opening University for Virtual Mobility. Opening University uh, as a specificity because we will see, we will use a specific approach uh, in the term of to open them, not only for mobility, but only for, um, but um, also for tools that we were able to use in order to implement the project. In this project, without Asmanius University, uh, University of Pavia, uh, Universidade Aberta di Lisbon, de Portugal, Universidad of Oviedo, 
was contributors and KU Leuven uh, was uh, participating as a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, uh, the general schema of uh, this uh, project in which four universities produced the content and activities and KU Leuven was the university acting as a supervisor and coordinator. Aims of the project was to design a master study program curriculum using open educational resource. So another time we can highlight the term open. So not only open university to collaboration um, in a view of international cooperation, but open university helping them in the use of open resources, open educational resources, applying correct licensing. So the idea is to use open resources uh, um, that we were able to search and find on, on the internet and then to reuse them to produce original product and to release them with a corded license. Then how to establish collaborative, trusted relationship. So please, each word is as an importance to collaborate, not only cooperate, but collaborate in a project together in the same topic, more team, trusted because there was an agreement between universities and relationship in designing the curriculum for multicultural exchange. And then how to integrate this open education, innovation in everyday practices. How can you see the idea was so wide and so ambitious in, uh, in uh, define uh, the aims of the project? But I think that in some manner, we were able to, uh, to achieve uh, the goal. And now it will be my pleasure to go on and illustrate you what we did. Um, of course, uh, Ayurina, in uh, her presentation, uh, um, presented this declaration from European Commission of Virtual Mobility. I invite you, so this is the same uh, declaration reported by Ayurina. I invite you, uh, and I, I like your uh, attention, on some specific and key words. The first one is institutional level institutional level. So here the point is that institution has to be involved and not only is not just a matter of collaboration between single professor in some free uh, initiatives uh, or some uh, free exchange of students, but institutional level that realize or facilitate international collaborative experiences. So the first institutional level, the second point, institutional relationship, and the third point, teaching and or learning. So not, not, not only or not at all exchange of ideas of collaboration, but digital mobility is about institutional level, international collaboration, teaching and or learning activities. So just to have clear the concept. The benefit for institution really, Irina was so perfect in uh, I light what are the benefit uh, for the, the institution. And uh, just I want to stress enhance sound competition uh, between uh, institutions. So the idea is, we can collaborate with other universities, but we want to demonstrate as, as University of Pavia or KU Leuven or Padova that our professor, our faculties are very good in uh, producer realize and in uh, thinking such kind of uh, collaboration. So there is good competition between, between organizations. And then, of course, when there is competition, the uh, international, the, the university have to has to open, has to be international, and as a result, 
the university will become recognizable. And as a result, it will be able to attract foreign students. So as you can see here, there are some good benefit for institution willing to um, uh, adhere to such kind of approach. At the same time, for students and teacher, for example, uh, for the student, linguistic competence, language competence, because uh, the students are forced uh, to go uh, and to interact in a new environment with people speaking a common language, for example, that will be, for example, uh, English language, English language. And so maybe at the, at the starting time, students are not so confident, but then in a second time, they take part. And uh, at the end, they will be happy because uh, this improved the level of English. This improved the cultural and intercultural ability to stay and to interact with other people. They will be able to improve their ICT uh, level old skills. And of course, they will improve personal and social characteristics. Of course, all these kind of skills and abilities improved will transform at the end of the curricular studies in university in more career opportunities. Um, we found in, in the project, uh, going in, in the project, we were able to identify some key success factors. Of course, no such kind of, um, how can I say, top-down level, but it has to come from a need, from a need to be more international, more collaborative, more intercultural. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, point is it comes from a need. Um, a lot of importance is integration of technology should not be technical barriers because if this if this is the case um, people refuse if they if uh, it is so difficult if the technology is not easy uh, the problem is that uh, people refuse and uh, prefer not to be involved. Of course, uh, enthusiasm and effective teamwork uh, are, um, are of a paramount importance. And uh, the really point for a key success factor is the engagement of four levels. Top management, institution, faculty and teacher, of course, student, but the staff. Uh, the staff have to be prepared to realize, to prepare the infrastructure in which which mobility uh, will move. Of course, in a blended way, blended here is, uh, um, we can think blended in this sense, um, partly synchronous, partly asynchronous, but there is absolutely the necessity of synchronous meetings. Of course, we can add here, if we think at the word blended, also with maybe physical presence. So the blend, the mix is always the better solution. A very, very important part we um, noticed in our project, absolutely of a paramount importance, is that everything has to be pre-planned and absolutely communicate to the student how the virtual mobility take place in the next month. Uh, of course, teacher has to be trained and supported. And um, a benevolent attitude and encouragement of the teacher, it's uh, a matter of fact, different cultures and different perspectives, of course, offer wider approach. From the point of view of the students, students have to know that they have to be particularly motivated. Uh, we cannot think about virtual mobility if we think about a student, a passive student, waiting that the professor will give the lesson. We need students with self-responsibility 
We need students able to plan and organize the own learning process. We need proactive students. We need, we need students with language knowledge and a bit of ICT skills. Of course, respect for diversity and intercultural differences. Self-reflection capability. So, um, not only, I mean, the students have success in virtual mobility, but these characteristics have to be present. Uh, as Irina said, there is, it is a bit difficult to uh, introduce uh, virtual mobility in institution, and in our case, also the use of open education uh, resources, because these innovations are hardly mainstreamed and haven't applied in university studies. Um, so uh, we can be more confident for the next year, and uh, we are, as Irina said, we are we work a lot in uh, this direction. But uh, uh, a lot of but we have to um, go on for uh, a lot of aspects again. The reason, because innovation are hard introducer to the teacher staff, it is difficult. We are experimenting this now in the University of uh, Favia, coming from the experience of a uh, pandemic. Uh, people generally are uh, love to stay in the same situation and not to learn more, more and more and more situation. The virtual mobility innovation needs to be introduced, as Irina said, to regular student exchange possibilities, hmm? communication, organization, and involvement and inclusion of, of a paramount importance in this process. And teachers should be, of course, trained on how to design open curriculum, train it, how to design open curriculum, and how it can be recognized afterwards in regular university study programs. Okay, some steps in the project, in the project I work in, so in OUVM, Opening University for Beach Mobility. Training material for university staff was developed on beach mobility curriculum design using open educational resources and Creative Commons license. Staff from consortium universities were trained during free one week short term mobility. So staff were created in each university and this staff for the time of one week worked in the different city of the project and received uh, training time from experts, okay? So this was, was more, very, very important to receive uh, the training time, to receive the training materials and training period, and to create collaboration intra and inter staff from different universities. So in this way, the consortium university were able to develop virtual mobility modules for a supposed master degree. Each partner will have to lead the development of two modules. In total, we have about 10 modules. Best experience from the partner. And um, uh, it was realized that this master, um, a very important point, no new courses was created, but traditional courses uh, were transformed from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual courses. So we worked on existing courses, traditional courses in each university, and the staff worked to transform it in virtual mobility mode. Um, very, very important here, that is, Institutional level, institutional level, I want to highlight this, please, the last point. Participant student from consortium universities received ECTS. This was possible involving international relation offices from each universities of the partnership that agree in bilateral agreements, recognize this um, courses released for each university. So the idea was that student receive a CTS for attending this course. 
no specific virtual learning environment was created, but each institution offered virtual mobility courses on their own virtual learning environment platform. And uh, a specific website was created to collect all the needed information and to serve as point of access to the virtual mobility uh, environment of each university. So staff training session, course development, intra and inter staff collaboration, produced and released open educational resources on Creative Commons license, exchange of experiences and tuning, but the very important point in this list is the administrative schemas, because I want to stress again on the importance of institutional level. Administrative schemas, uh, so useful and mandatory for internal affair, for international relation office, and administrative schemas detailed and precise for students in order to learn them how to move, how to do in a framework of virtual mobility. Hmm? This was the access point, uh, the website that uh, the um, uh, students of a uh, um, partnership university reached in order to uh, choose uh, the, the course. This was uh, uh, the, uh, how can I say, um, each university of the four university produced course and KU Leuven was a coordinator. Outcomes. All the modules were implemented. Each institution provided for internal calls. That is, case each institution was committed to inform the student about these initiatives, provide for internal calls, and to select students in order to uh, foster their participation to the virtual mobility initiatives. Uh, surveys for teachers and students were prepared and run and about 60 um, uh, students for institution attended to the programs, modules, internal and external students. Hmm. Um, here uh, in the slide, uh, there are um, the addresses of uh, the website in which you can reach the training materials prepared and the courses released. So each of you, can uh, reach uh, how we prepare the staff preparing these training materials and the produce of the project, that is the courses released. Here are, uh, in a nutshell, the courses released, hmm? just to make you. Okay, we are just at the final part, just some uh, minute uh, again, Sandra, just to uh, show uh, to um, the attendees uh, the result. What were the students' expectations and doubts? In green, the expectation, the positive part. Okay, I am interested about the topics of the courses and I am interested about this experience in open educational resource. Okay, I will improve uh, myself in using digital, digital technologies and in project work, in group work. This sounds me good. Uh, okay, it, it, will, it, it will be an interesting experience. And I will improve my level um, of uh, English uh, language. But in red, hmm, working in an international and in intercultural group, I don't know. Some problem may be. Uh, using English language as unique and common language, maybe I will not be so good uh, as uh, other participant, which will be my level of confidence in using English. Oh, there will be an intensive use of technological tools. I will be able to and end the problem. We, uh, I, I am so good in order to manage uh, properly my time because we need, if you remember, uh, motivate the student and uh, able to uh, self-regulation of life study. Hmm? Ex post evaluation. Great success in the cooperation, so the green part is positive. No problem, put digital tools, it was easy, no barriers, fine. 
Both individual and group work were considered relevant, as well as researches, presentation, analysis, and discussions held during the course. But students would have appreciated more feedback on weekly group work released and presented during different meetings. So again, um, a great desire from the student to stay in touch with the teacher, with other people, in order to have more feedback about the work done. Hmm? Students' feedback. Okay, we were able to achieve the goals of the course. Uh, there, was, there was a relevant improvement in English language. Perfect. Intercultural aspect and social relation coming from the course were much appreciated. Students developed more confidence in using uh, digital technology. Students developed more awareness in their critical and reflective abilities. And from my side, the last point maybe is the more important point of the list. We are at the end. Overall assessment. 90% of participants declared to have positively modified their attitude to visual mobility. So at the, at the, at the starting time, they, was, they were a bit um, doubt, with some doubts. The last slide, uh, we are at the end. Lesson learned of this project. The main critical factors for succeeding belong to organization and communication aspects. So if we are able to, or, to well pre-organize and if we are well able to properly communicate and to properly involve students and teachers and staff, we uh, can say to, uh, we, that we will be able to avoid a lot of troubles. So this is really the main critical factors. ICT tools are now, more now than some years ago, easy to use and totally suitable for online education. So I, I, I really laugh when I, when I hear also here in Italy, oh, distance education is not uh, the same, has to stay in a room because this is not, there is not interaction, there is not the possibility for working group. Absolutely, this is not true. ICT tools are easy to use and totally suitable for online education properly. Digital mobility, finally, will be totally integrated in higher education processes if during the curricular development, advantages for students and also for teachers will be taken in consideration and properly shared with them, disseminate to them. If not, of course, people will stay with the doubts that the better idea of education is to go to the home university and attend lessons in presence, or the, the unique form of uh, proper internationalization is to have uh, present, presence physically uh, in another country. Finally, I want to say, uh, Irina used the verb enrich. Absolutely, this is not the case to substitute physical mobility, but the case here is to enrich the mobility with virtual mobility, adding also mm, this way, this way who is uh, so useful for student and professor for the motivation that both Irene and I tried to demonstrate uh, during our presentation. Maybe I used some more time, sorry for this, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elena. Uh, very, very good example. Uh, I saw that people have asked for the uh, link uh, to web pages. Uh, you really clearly stated the, 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 all the issues uh, and things uh, one have to think about uh, when preparing uh, such a program. Um, I said I saw that prerequisites are motivated students uh, knowing how to manage their own time. Um, it's, 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 I would say it's much easier to write, write it than uh, to achieve it because sometimes students definitely are willing to participate but on the way uh, are not able to, to, 
uh, fulfill uh, all the expectations uh, uh, and maybe they have better picture on themselves than uh, they they are really uh, so something uh, uh, to think about so in that way uh, did you think within the program uh, to ensure some kind of consolation for students uh, some kind of um, uh, mentoring part uh, uh, to help them uh, uh, to to stay on the program and to uh, um, uh, to over uh, uh, pass uh, all the obstacles uh, uh, in which they encounter uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for this uh, question, because uh, um, I have the culture that uh, not only the best student have to undertake such kind of possibility, but all the students. So we can, we have, we, our duty is, is to support the student that maybe um, are not the best one. Just for this reason, the University of Pavia now is participating in a project calling uh, Digital Passport uh, and uh, involving in how to help students during the phases of mobility. And one of these modules is cultural shock or problem during the mobility. So I am in trouble, I am in difficulties, I don't know how to, and we are prepared some capsules, some ideas in order how to support the student uh, during uh, the undertaking of uh, his uh, mobility, both virtual or physical. So the idea is to work also in this direction. Thank you, Elena. Really, really good example. I think it can be a showcase uh, to others uh, how to do things. So let's move on. We are running a little bit of uh, time. So next uh, is Francesca, if I'm correct. Uh, no, we said next is Vim, sorry. So, Vim, you are the next. Uh, please, uh, you have your uh, 15 minutes uh, to present introductionary uh, the topic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandra. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Um, boom, boom. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. My name is Wim van Petekem. I come from the University of Leuven. Uh, it has been mentioned already uh, in this webinar. Um, after the introductions uh, by, by Irina and Elena, um, I will go and tell you a little bit more about one practical case where virtual mobility is applied in a concrete, uh, in, in, in a course actually uh, that is offered uh, by my university and uh, another university across the ocean in the States, Penn State University. Um, and I will talk about um, virtual mobility in practice. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, teaching on and for intercultural competences. Um, let's see how I can move to the next slide. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, intercultural competences uh, are becoming more and more important. Important, uh, as had has been said already, uh, but you should see that in, in a whole complex of, uh, let's say, new skills and competences that um, our students are expected to achieve when they graduate at the university. Um, there is a lot more of a lot more competences uh, than, than just related to uh, the, the, the scientific domain in which you are studying. Um, this gives just a uh, an overview of, of competences that have been identified uh, also by, let's say, the workforce, uh, the, 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 the companies, uh, the, the, the organizations, the government, where, where our graduates uh, will start working afterwards uh, when they graduate. Um, they expect that our students will have new competences related to the digital world in which they are living, uh, related to a, a connected world, a, a networked world, an open uh, global world. Um, and so we have to prepare in one or another way our students for that new world, so to say. Um, and that is what we would like to uh, to do with, with our course. Um, in, in Leuven, the course is called Professional and Intercultural Competences for Engineers. Um, my... Uh, my colleagues at the University of Penn State University call the course Engineering Beyond Borders. Um, okay, it's for engineers. Uh, it, it, 
but but it can be applied to many other uh, types of studies uh, as as well. Um, but but okay, uh, in in our case, we focus on engineering students. Uh, like I already mentioned, it is important that we give our students uh, during their uh, studies already a flavor of what would it mean working in an international company in an inter. In, in, in a global uh, world uh, full of digital technologies uh, with different cultures. Uh, I think that this is an important aspect uh, that I would like to emphasize here. Uh, so uh, in our university, it is embedded in the postgraduate program on innovation and entrepreneurship in, in engineering. Uh, at Penn State University, it is part of the engineering leadership development program. Remember uh, what, what uh, both Irina and Elena already said, uh, we talk about virtual mobility uh, in, in when it is really part of the, 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 the mainstream activities going on in the university. So the course I'm talking about here here is, is, is part of, of uh, full programs offered by our universities. Um, and so um, what are then the, the, the learning objectives? Well, uh, I think that's a little bit beyond the topic of this webinar here, but, but um, uh, especially we would like to, to explain uh, engineers, what does it mean to work in international teams, uh, in virtual teams? Uh, how can they actually, um, yeah, um, develop the skills that are necessary uh, to um, yeah, solve an engineering problem, uh, not just with uh, engineers in the same room, but, but with engineering teams all over the world. Um, they learn how to, 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 uh, yeah, to set up such teams, uh, how to de develop their own, let's say, skills to work in, in, in such a team. Um, also learn about the team dynamics, uh, what's happening in such a virtual team, um, and how can they maybe also become a sort of leader in the team. Uh, so that is part of the, 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 let's say, the learning objectives of the course. Uh, so it's, it's, it's about intercultural competences, inter, uh, the virtual team, uh, team collaboration, uh, and so on. Uh, but we also would like to, to let them experience it uh, firsthand, so to say, by embedding them in a virtual team uh, in the course itself. Um, so that is uh, what, what we wanted uh, to achieve with the course. Uh, the, the things we are uh, teaching uh, in the course are based on two books, which are quite well known, I think, in the field where, when, when you talk about intercultural competences. Um, we refer to Hofstede, who is a Dutch uh, engineer that worked in, in uh, global companies for most of his life um, and who then uh, took the time to, to think about what are now these intercultural competences. Uh, and um, I, I think it, it's it's debatable what he did, uh, but but at the other hand, I think it's, it's an interesting resource uh, if you would like to start thinking about intercultural competences uh, in, in a global world uh, and, and especially in an engineering world. Uh, the other book uh, at the right hand side mentioned here is a sort of encyclopedia, uh, Kiss, Bow or Shake Hands, um, which is uh, yeah, giving for many countries in the world uh, a sort of overview of things that you, you, you better know before you start working with, with people in those countries or before you visit and, 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 and uh, yeah, start collaborating with people in such a country. Uh, again, debatable uh, because it's more like an encyclopedia and, and uh, it's generalizing things and, and, and maybe there is some bias in it. Uh, so uh, be, be careful if if you read it, uh, but at the other hand, it, it's it's also a good starting point for discussing uh, when you work with people in other countries. Uh, okay, that was about the books. Um, okay, the course characteristics is it, it develops about uh, around five themes uh, that that we would like to uh, to address in the course. Uh, starting from yourself and, and your own uh, uh, competences and, uh, and, and your own identity, let's say, uh, how you then develop uh, and work in teams. Uh, and eventually uh, we end up with talking about cultures in organizations, uh, in, in companies uh, in general. Uh, of course, the language we use uh, is, is, is English in this case. Um, that was sort uh, taken as a sort of given uh, by all the students. Uh, the format uh, that we used in this course and, and that 
that applies to the, uh, to virtual mobility is that um, we had uh, in the first edition at least uh, we had synchronous video conference lectures um, twice a week um, and so there was faculty in Leuven and faculty in, in Penn State University that were actually giving lectures um, twice a week um, to the students. Uh, and that was then complemented with, uh, of course, coursework, um, readings and case studies, uh, also individual assignments uh, and group discussions. Uh, and then the, the, the let's say an, another main part of the course is related to a project that the students have to uh, to, to work on. Uh, a project uh, related to an engineering problem somewhere in the global world um, and we, where we in the divided the students in teams, virtual teams, uh, where there is students from Leuven and students from Penn State University um, gathered in one team and, and working together in, in that one team across the ocean. Uh, so they, they had to apply what, what they were learning in the course uh, in different steps to the project that they were working on in that virtual team. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, here's a, a few pictures. Uh, you, you will remember uh, that's the time when we were, uh, were having video conferences uh, in, in dedicated rooms with dedicated equipment uh, and uh, where we were sharing content uh, all together. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's normal. Uh, and uh, we also have to say that uh, we sometimes interrupt the video conference lecture to, to allow local discussions with the students uh, at both sides. Uh, just to make sure that that uh, we, we we could uh, also take benefit of the fact that students were still coming together in a sort of classroom context um, and that we could also uh, yeah discuss our own let's say perception of what what's happening and what was told in the course um, based on uh, how we could discuss that on a local level uh, okay um, the first run was was in 20 15, so long before uh, Corona pandemic uh, was uh, disturbing uh, our educational systems. Um, uh, some experiences that students had with uh, uh, the uh, uh, with, with the first edition was that they 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 liked it. Uh, it was uh, interesting. They told us uh, it was relevant. Uh, but uh, what they were saying was that uh, having two lectures uh, every week uh, where the teachers uh, were um, yeah, sort of uh, transferring their knowledge uh, in, in a very short time into one video conference session, um, that was a bit too much. Uh, so it was for them, it was um, heavy, let's say, uh, to, to, yeah, to catch up with all the material uh, that was provided in the video conferencing sessions. Um, and so they, they were asking for more time for discussion. Um, that was certainly something um, and that it was at the same time also a bit difficult uh, during the video conference sessions to already start collaborating in, 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 in their teams, in their virtual teams. Um, so they were asking for us to, 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 to reconsider that. Uh, okay, the teachers were also uh, quite happy uh, and the, the uh, one thing that we had to do was to, to overcome uh, barriers related to different educational settings. Uh, for instance, the time zone uh, problems, uh, academic calendars was a very uh, difficult one uh, to overcome. Uh, for instance, this year, if we uh, organized the, we organized the course again, uh, the, 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 the American students uh, have already started uh, end of August uh, and we will start next week in Leuven. Uh, so there is some flexibility needed uh, from the teachers uh, to catch up with, with this uh, yeah, asynchronous uh, uh, academic calendar, so to say. Um, and another interesting remark to make is that, uh, and it's related to the educational systems, um, but the grading, uh, the, the, the assessment of students is, is also something you have to take care of um, in the sense that um, in, in the US, students are expecting, for instance, uh, high, um, high grades uh, when they do everything what is asked for. Um, in Leuven, we give only higher grades to students uh, when they are doing uh, 
extra work uh, than than what we are asking. Um, so there is, uh, yeah, need to, to to make sure that the, the 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 grades that we are giving are acceptable at both sides of the ocean. Uh, so we have to think about that. Um, and uh, important was also to note that. Um, um, opposite to what the students could uh, not do actually. Um, we had a chance as teachers uh, to meet face-to-face -face before we started um, the, the first edition of the course. Uh, and that helped of course, because then there was sort of trust relation between the teachers uh, we knew each other. We uh, we we had a good feeling, uh, and we became yeah even more than just professional colleagues. And um, there was a sort of friendship between the, the 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 teachers that also helped us to overcome all sorts of uh, uh, yeah barriers that that came across uh, in the course. Uh, Okay, so after that first run, uh, we started talking, uh, thinking about, uh, okay, what can we now improve to, to, uh, yeah, to accommodate the concerns of the students and at the same time also to help us as teachers. Um, and there we decided that a flipped classroom model would be a good idea. Um, so what we tried to do then was uh, we provided uh, all the learning materials online. Uh, and we were fortunate enough that the colleagues in Penn State University uh, could get sorts of grant uh, so that we could develop a fully online course uh, that uh, was uh, um, giving all the concepts and all the ideas, definitions uh, that we wanted to cover in the course. Um, and we then said, okay, instead of two uh, video conferencing sessions, we will limit it to one uh, and it will not be a lecture, uh, but it will be dedicated uh, to a discussion that we could have uh, with the students at both sides of the ocean, uh, where we could then digest the learning material that they already studied before they came to the session. Um, so that was the, the, the major change that we made from the first edition to the second edition of the course. Uh, and that was uh, also helping uh, yeah, the students uh, to, to better digest the material, let's say. Uh, there was also some, some work done on the topics uh, and, and uh, what we wanted, uh, yeah, what we learned from the first edition that we had to implement in the second edition. Uh, Okay, so the second run of the course was then uh, uh, offered in spring 2017. Uh, you might have seen that, that there is always a limited number of students. Uh, it's small numbers of students at both sides of the ocean uh, involved in the course, which makes it also uh, feasible for us as teachers uh, to, to adapt to certain needs uh, that might pop up and that we have to address. Um, so at, in, in the second edition, uh, it was so that in Penn State, they decided to, to even uh, just stick to uh, um, the, the, the online uh, course and, and, and there were no classroom participation. Uh, there was no classroom participation. Um, here in Leuven, we, we went for the blend. Uh, so the students were still coming to the classroom. We organized the, uh, the, the video conferencing sessions where the teachers from, uh, from uh, Penn State University were involved, not their students. Uh, and so we, we we tested out the flipped classroom model, uh, and we, we we tried to see how that could work uh, with um, in, in in this format. Um, okay, and um, we saw that uh, yeah, this is a, a picture of the the the, the online course. Uh, it's offered by Penn State University. So uh, there was no need to, uh, to copy that course to, to the system in Leuven. We, we simply had access to the, uh, the, the learning platform of our colleagues in, uh, in Penn State University. Uh, so the students liked the online material, also liked the flipped classroom model. Uh, and they were also happy with sort of the discussions uh, that we could have in the, in the, in the video conference. Uh, what they disliked a bit was uh, that I was still as a teacher talking talking too much. Uh, and, and so uh, I was uh, sort of leading the discussion at certain points, uh, but while leading the discussion, I was also involved in the discussions myself a, a little bit too much, according to the students. Um, and then there were also some practical details uh, in, with the course, uh, but, but that is not important for the story today. Um, so just a few quotes of the students. Um, they, they were, um, 
uh, yeah, they 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 would have liked to to um, yeah to get to know the students anyway. And although the participants uh, from from Penn State University were only online, that was not sufficient for the students. They really wanted to see their faces, uh, so that there was a sort of yeah um, contact possible uh, with the students. And and certainly in the beginning of the course, that would have helped them. Uh, we forgot about that. Uh, so. Um, the yeah, and, and I, I think that it was also important that students said that they uh, were happy that they could still come to the class and meet their peers in the classroom, uh, and that we then connected two sides all together. Uh, I will come back to that later because in Corona that was a bit more difficult. Uh, so based on that, uh, we went to the third edition, and and now we uh, we, we introduced the, the the blend also in Penn State University. Uh, so we had the flipped classroom model still, uh, and then we had the students uh, live in a classroom in Leuven and live in a classroom in Penn State University, and then we used uh, again uh, video conferencing, web conferencing, actually uh, to um, uh, uh, to connect the two sites and and to to, to really go into discussion not only with the teachers in Penn State University but also with the students there. Um, so that was certainly something that students uh, liked very much. Uh, we have to say that also in the third edition, uh, it, it was becoming more and more clear for us that we had an international group of students, both in Leuven and both in Penn State. In Leuven, it was not just Belgian students. Uh, same in Penn State University, it was not just American students. Uh, so we could also take benefit of the fact that we had students with different backgrounds. Uh, and therefore, we uh, decided that at the beginning of the live session uh, together, uh, that we would like the students to tell a little little bit about their background. Uh, it started uh, because students wanted to say a few words in the language of their peers, uh, but we, we, we enlarged that and, and enhanced that a little bit so that they could also talk about their culture. And, and students love to do that. Uh, they really wanted to introduce something about their own culture into the lecture uh, to such an extent that it even became an, an, an essential part of the course uh, and, and maybe in, in the beginning even a, a, a too elaborated part of the course. Uh, so we had to, 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 to reduce the amount of time spent on that uh, later on. Uh, but it was interesting to see how students were really uh, yeah, enjoying the fact that they were learning about um, other cultures uh, in, in such a life experience. Uh, as uh, said in the, in the third edition, we no longer were using dedicated video conferencing equipment, but at that time we shifted to uh, Skype for Business as the tool uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we were using. Okay. In the fourth edition, uh, we moved again uh, from, from Skype for Business to Zoom. Uh, and then uh, we, we there were not that much uh, changes anymore because we sort of were established uh, with, with the course and, and, and we were happy with the way it went. Uh, I think that uh, this is now the sort of format that we appreciate uh, with uh, uh, a sort of flipped classroom model uh, and then live discussions with students. Oh, I forgot to say that uh, in, in the third edition, it was no longer me that was leading the discussion or no longer the, the colleagues in Penn State University that were leading the discussion. Uh, but we asked the students to lead the discussion discussion themselves. Uh, so because it was a flipped classroom model, they had to study the material beforehand. Uh, and we each time asked uh, one or two students uh, to prepare a little bit more than the others uh, in the sense that they had to prepare for leading the classroom discussion. Uh, so at that point, I was I was certain just a participant in the discussion. And I, I just enjoyed what the students were preparing as, as a discussion format. Uh, and I have to say that the creativity of the students was sometimes higher than what we could do as teachers. Um, so we learned also a lot as teachers from how students were dealing with the material and how they wanted their colleagues, their peers uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to digest the material during the video conferencing sessions. Uh, and so that's another aspect that we now uh, still want to do uh, in, in next 
next editions of the course. Uh, in the meantime, we have had fifth and sixth editions uh, of, of the course. Um, there is just one thing that I would like to add here uh, as uh, a, a final uh, remark, and that was uh, due to the, 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 the COVID pandemic last year, um, it was not possible for students uh, to meet in the classroom uh, physically, face to face, uh, not in Leuven and also not at Penn State University. Uh, but still, we wanted to, 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 to have a sort of uh, feeling with the students uh, that they could come to a classroom and, and sit together with, the, 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 let's say, the locals. Um, and therefore, we, we organized a parallel session to the, 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 the main session uh, for the discussion. Um, and in that parallel session, we started, let's say, half an hour before we made the connection with the other side. Um, and we let the students enter that parallel session session just like they enter a classroom um, and that was a sort of informal moment for the students uh, where they could talk about everything um, I also participated there uh, as, as okay I was the teacher um, and so students could also address me as a teacher just like they do when they enter a classroom and they have a question that they would like to ask to the teacher um, so that was a, a, a sort of mimicking the, the, the classroom uh, feeling uh, so students could come there uh, from half an hour before the, the real uh, session and then we we uh, all together we moved then to the, 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 the synchronous session with the other side um, and when that was finished uh, we all came back to our uh, parallel session uh, with with only the local students as a sort of debriefing moment moment uh, where there may be some local questions that students wanted to ask uh, maybe they they just wanted to say something about a, they uh, they they wanted to share um, and actually i have to say that this worked very very well for the students um, and um, yeah that was for them especially in the pandemic times when they could not see each other and uh, face to face uh, for them it gave them a sort of yeah connection with with the classroom mates uh, and I think that this was something that that, that yeah we also have to cherish uh, in in virtual mobility. Uh, if if it cannot all be virtual, it can also maybe not all be 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 face to face uh, like. Corona was was disturbing that that feeling, um, but with that parallel session, uh, the, the students could at least have the sort of uh, feeling of belonging to the, the to, to the class. Uh, and I think that this was, um, I think it was important for the students because every student was there half an hour before the class actually started, uh, just because they enjoyed that so much. Uh, I just want to give that as, uh, as, as, as a lesson learned for myself that uh, you can do a lot virtual, you can do a lot blended, uh, but uh, try to also include that, that, that sense of belonging uh, in, uh, uh, to a virtual team, a virtual class, uh, and so on. Uh, I think that this is, uh, oh yeah, there is uh, in the slides that we will provide you, there is some literature that you could, uh, we, we published a few articles um, about this uh, uh, program uh, where you can see a bit more details. Uh, okay, and that's uh, the end of my practical example of how virtual mobility can be implemented uh, in a real course. Thank you, Wim. Uh, really, really good. Uh, I especially like this part, how you adapted uh, while pandemic uh, and uh, organized uh, this uh, uh, for students so that they uh, do not have such feeling of being alone, alone uh, in this situation. Uh, I think it's very valuable. Uh, as we are lacking a little bit of time, I'm now going to move on to Francesca. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you, if participants have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, so we will answer them uh, there. So uh, the next uh, speaker is Francesca Helm. So Francesca, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just getting the presentation. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you and the slides are perfect. Thank it's you. Much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, virtual exchange as an instrument for the internationalization of the healthcare curriculum with, with some examples. And um, I would just like to start talking a little bit about um, the, 
the the the, the terminology. So I know there is um, one of the problems with with our field is this the many different terms that we use. And I think virtual exchange is perhaps a sub aspect, if you like, of virtual mobility. It's um, you know Elena and and Irina talked about you know the the, the institutional the importance of institutional level collaboration. Um, and virtual exchange is can you know can and should be institutionalized as well. But the focus in in the literature is very much on the interaction part of it. So it's about the the people to people. The, the, what what Wim was talking about at the end, you know, the students interacting with one another, this sense of belonging. And so it's it's this side of if if we're talking about student mobility, it's this side of student mobility that that virtual exchange seeks to work on. So the definition is that it's technology enabled people-to-people dialogues um, sustained over a period of time. So as I said, the focus is on the people-to-people interactions. And so we are simply using media platforms to enable this deep interactive social learning. And the interactions are very often facilitated to ensure that they are meaningful. So the idea of um, having students interact with one another over a distance it, it doesn't happen automatically. It needs to be designed through tasks. But also, um, we found that trained dialogue facilitators are very helpful in promoting deeper level discussions, um, particularly on difficult issues on intercultural learning. And so, again, it, it's like virtual mobility. It's not anything new. It has been developed over 30 years from experiences in, in, in different areas, so from educational exchange it also has been um, used a lot in foreign language education, but also the, the dialogue focus comes from the field of peace building. So it, it is something that, that has existed for, for a while. Um, the idea is to promote reciprocity, so reciprocal learning. It's not I'm teaching you. It's not unidirectional in terms of the flow of information and, 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 and dialogue, but it, it's reciprocal learning. We learn from each other. And it's intended to allow for equity and inclusiveness. And so in relation to physical exchange, it can be, it doesn't need to, to blend with physical exchange. It can complement, it can prepare for, it can deepen, and it can extend physical exchanges if we need to look at them in relation. And it can also stimulate interest in physical exchange, overcoming the fear. I think Elena mentioned, you know, students are perhaps scared of going abroad, this anxiety, but having an international experience online may may increase the interest and lessen the fear. And so, again, to talk about why virtual exchange, I'd just like to focus on, on, on what, what students have said about this kind of experience. This is uh, from a project which was about history, actually, and I think history is a very interesting field for virtual exchange, but what the student reports here, I think, is relevant to any, any field. Through this project, I was able to meet new people with whom I could exchange ideas and opinions. The subject chosen for this project allowed me, as a Romanian history student, to see another side of the discourse regarding these events. The events they were looking at was um, 100 years after the end of the First World War. So this, and this is an exchange between Romanian and Hungarian students. And so the idea of, you know, how, how national histories, they are very one sided. So the idea was exchanging um, experiences and discourses about how historical events were being remembered. Um, so the exchange allowed me to see another side of the discourse and made me realize that such controversial events can't be analyzed from just one perspective. Also, it helped me to refine my teamwork skills, but also time and task management capabilities. So we have content specific competences and, and widening of horizon, but also these transversal skills that we've talked about a lot, teamwork, uh, task management. Um, a couple of other quotes from students. Again, it's amazing that we can all share our opinions at the same time about the same topic. It opened my eyes. We see this a lot, opening my eyes, because there are people from a lot of countries who've made me realize that my point of view is not the only one. I see the world from a Western European person point of view, and that is definitely not the only perspective. I could see that each country has a very different way of thinking than me. So again, I, I don't think you know, we necessarily have national perspectives, though we may have national ways, national legal system, national ways of doing certain things. But I think what is interesting here 
is how through the exchange this person has learned to her Western European perspective on the issues that they were discussing. And again, in terms of inclusivity, you know, student mobility is, is the privilege of, you know, less than 10% of the student population in Europe. At least we haven't reached the 20% that, that was the aim for 2020. And here the student says, you know, since I was young, I've always dreamed to go abroad, see the world, meet foreign cultures. I could never afford or participate in Erasmus mobility. But thanks to this, I succeeded in getting in touch with people around the world who I shared my ideas and thoughts with. Again, so this highlights the, the focus also on the, the person to person dimension. And so just we've seen a lot of examples of um, virtual mobility. Um, here, these are examples that could be considered virtual mobility, but also with the virtual exchange components. So designing for the interactions between the students. And there are just two examples which I wasn't directly involved with, but I've come to know through my um, involvement in professional development for teaching staff and in my research on virtual exchange. So the first one, um, this was a, a project that was developed in the context of Erasmus Virtual Exchange, which was a pilot project of the European Commission. And it involved partners in the UK, Portsmouth University and um, Sweden. Um, and it was an exchange for healthcare professionals. And so the aims for the students, as defined by, by the teachers, Martha and her colleague in Sweden, were to improve students' communication skills to raise cultural awareness across borders and across healthcare professions. What they were looking on was the collaboration of, of different healthcare professionals in, in the field. Practice communication skills in the digital era by exploring a variety of digital collaboration tools. And this was actually before COVID. Um, become able to identify barriers to effective interprofessional collaboration and suggest ways of overcoming them using real life case studies. So the problem they had identified in, in both of the courses is um, interprofessional collaboration, which seems to be a, a problem in, in many different contexts. So the exchange was for them to talk about interprofessional collaboration in their respective contexts. And how were they to do this? So the actual exchange lasted seven weeks um, and it was embedded in the courses of the two colleagues. Okay, so it's an exchange which was kind of embedded. And they had to do individual and group tasks and to facilitate the, um, the group building and the interactions between the students, they had some facilitated dialogue sessions which were offered by the Erasmus Virtual Exchange Project. So trained facilitators um, engaged the students in interactions before they actually started the collaboration and midway through the collaboration to see how the groups were getting on in their interactions. The students explored interprofessional collaboration in the different contexts, so UK and Sweden. And how did they do this? By carrying out interviews with practitioners in their local contexts. And then they created podcasts and videos to share this information that they had gathered with their fellow group members. So they used podcasts and videos to share knowledge of national health systems of the countries involved. And then in their transnational groups, they developed case studies to illustrate good practice in interprofessional collaboration to enhance the patient experience. So this was the collaborative task, developing the case studies. And through this, they could learn from each other's experience and extend their working knowledge between the countries and the systems. And um, this is a... Um, a blog post on, on the um, university's UAC website by Marta Roldo, who was actually the Erasmus Plus coordinator of for the School of Pharmacy and Biomedical Sciences at Portsmouth. And she um, says that she'd been engaging with Erasmus Exchange student mobility for over 10 years, planning for all these students to take part in summer placements um, with various partner institutions. But she came through the um, Erasmus Virtual Exchange project to understand that, you know, the importance of also having um, online experience, virtual experiences. Um, so this is why the title of the, of the article, why I don't believe in a one size fits all approach to student exchanges. 
Um, and here she says the challenge of uh, presenting themselves and the topics they study via different communication tools pushed them out of their comfort zone and helped build their confidence. Virtual exchange is a powerful tool to enhance students' communication skills and other transferable skills in the digital era. And then there is a quote from the student, but I've shared the link in the slide so you can read the full article if you're interested. Um, another exchange is, um, I heard about it from a colleague at the University of Padova, um, who presented it recently in, in, in a staff week. And this was led by the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences with nursing department partners in Austria, Denmark, France, Italy, Madagascar, and Portugal. And this was a very new project. So it was actually developed in order to replace the lack of mobility due to COVID. So it, it was a, um, a recent project and developed kind of almost last minute because of COVID. Though the Western Norway University had taken part in a COIL experience with the United States and with Madagascar the previous year. And so here in, in preparing for this exchange, um, coordinators had weekly meetings to define how many of students would be involved, how they would facilitate the exchange to develop the phases of the project, the objectives, the tasks, the learning outcomes, tools and platforms. So this is just to give you an idea of how intense the collaboration is in order to develop such a collaborative exchange. Um, but this professor who, who presented the project recently said that despite the fact that they were all absolute beginners in this kind of experience, they managed through these weekly meetings to create a cohesive group and have a positive collaboration. And the numbers, um, again, in, in, are, are quite striking because actually with seven partners, they had 220 students signed up for the project and they involved a lot of teaching staff. So there was three, 33 teaching staff in all. Um, in Italy, the University of Padova involved six people, also with the idea of um, developing the, the competences and the capabilities of the teachers and the tutors in their experiences of facilitating and supporting this exchange. And so how it worked is that each university developed a theme. So there were actually um, about 20 different themes were developed. For example, technology and nursing, was one, global health and intercultural nursing and communication was another, global health workers, global health and aging, road accidents. This is just to give you an idea of the, the themes that, e that they worked on. And then within the theme, there were specific tasks and discussion topics for the students. So each partner university took responsi responsibility for developing um, two or three of these themes and designing the tasks and the discussion groups following though a similar kind of matrix. So there was uniformity in the design of the tasks and the discussion questions, but uh, based on these different themes that, that each university was responsible for. They created 25 different groups and each group had students from each of the universities. And their main tasks were to analyze and compare the theme in the different national contexts. Um, they were supposed to draw on the literature on this theme, again, from the national context, and they were supposed to suggest strategies for improvement. That is, suggest strategies on how to address the problems that they've identified through their research. And so they collaborated again through seven weeks, through individual and group tasks. They ex um, Yes, again, it's very similar to the other one. They, they, they carried out interviews. Um, the final assignment was to actually prepare a group poster presentation, and they shared this on a Padlet. Okay, so similar to the other one, they developed case studies to, 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 to show the good practice, but they also did this final group presentation on Padlet. And as I said, the students learned from each other's experience and their knowledge between countries and systems. And so the, the positive outcomes of this exchange for the teachers involved, though, you know, it wasn't the rose fiori, as we'd say in Italy, you know, there were some problems, some of the groups didn't work well. Um, they were also doing their placements within the national context. So they had, you know, difficulties, some of the students in finding time for this. But overall, it was evaluated pos positively and they want to repeat the experience with additional partners. They also told me that they're carrying out focus groups 
um, for a research study on this transnational collaborative experience, which they hope to submit to the Journal of Nursing Education. And starting from the bottom up, so this started as a kind of grassroots collaboration, if you like, what they're trying to do now is see how they can integrate this experience in university curricula. Because also, you know, as Irina and Elena have both pointed out, it, it's still not mainstream. So we still don't really have mechanisms for recognizing this kind of transnational collaborative activity within our institutions. So these were just two examples related to, to the, the area of health, and I hope they were useful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Very valuable examples. I think today we uh, clearly showed what actually is virtual mobility and virtual exchange with a number of examples, case studies proven to work well showing uh, the effort from the organizer part, uh, you know, institution teacher, but also from the student part, uh, what should they invest and how would they uh, invest and why they are participating. Naming the positives, uh, positive uh, results and some obstacles or uh, some doubts students had uh, during, uh, during such uh, programs. Uh, we are going over the time, but at the end, uh, I'll just give uh, you uh, to summarize in one or two sentences. Um, how do you see the future of virtual mobility in exchange? Will it become a much more present in formal education or maybe the informal education will be that uh, where it can have a significant impact? So uh, how present it will be in, in, for example, next decade? So maybe to start from Irina. I am confident uh, about the fact that uh, uh, blended virtual mobility is uh, already uh, in uh, uh, higher education in Europe in one or another form, maybe very, very first steps taken, uh, uh, maybe not uh, formally everything correctly uh, set up uh, for uh, students and teachers, but uh, the concept already I think is uh, in high education. In the current decade, I wish that uh, virtual exchange and the virtual mobility is recognized for students and teachers is a part of formal studies that students are able to have this option to select it and to get recognition, but teachers as well. And I think studies in higher education changed. Uh, the um, traditional system when we calculate, when, when we um, uh, plan uh, studies, we need already to look from the new perspective. Uh, it only depends uh, how much we want this innovation to be penetrating into, into our regular studies. It's my time, Sandra. Okay. Yes, I muted myself, sorry. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Irina, Elena, please okay. uh, give us some yeah, uh, I think that in some manners in the last years, uh, a lot of movement uh, arose uh, in internet from one side, uh, massive open online courses uh, or um, such kind of other idea of using uh, the potentiality of uh, internet and technologies. In this field also, virtual mobility moved. I really think that uh, one initiative from Europe, uh, that is the one of the European alliances, uh, um, can in some way go in the direction of virtual mobility. That is the idea to create such kind of alliances between university in order to exchange courses. And I think that this kind of work together with different teams of different university will for sure foster another, how can I say, way of thing, another setting from both institution, not only both, sorry, institution, uh, professor, uh, students and staff. So the idea is like Irina, I am confident, uh, uh, a lot of uh, tentative um, initiatives uh, are running. Maybe we want, we are 
we, we have to walk in order to refine, to precise, and to give uh, the correct model. But I think that at the end, uh, challenges from the future, first of all, the climate change will push us in order to work more and more collaboratively in different teams, in creating culture, using uh, different teams from all over the world. And this, of course, in some way will be recognized as, as digital mobility. So I am confident that the movement will arise and will improve uh, in the next future. Thank you, Elena. And Wim, your summary. Uh, my summary. Um, I, I think I, when you asked the question like that, Sandra, I, I, I'm thinking at a certain moment uh, we we went from learning to e-learning, uh, and now it's 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 kind of obvious that that the e is in the learning uh, uh, happening. And so we are sort of back to 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 learning, and we call it blended learning, we call it high flex learning, whatever. Um, I think that um, just like that kind of movement, uh, I think that virtual mobility will also become a sort of obvious part of, of, of our learning. Um, at a certain point, uh, we will we, we still have to, to do some efforts to to um, to yeah to include examples of virtual mobility in what we are doing in our universities. Um, but it will become so obvious uh, that this is integral part of what we what we teach and how we teach in the university um, and how we want to learn as 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 a learner, a lifelong learner, uh, that we will no longer make the difference anymore um, i mean we will find it normal that uh, we go to the classroom and meet our local peers uh, but at the same time that we also engage in in, in virtual activities online uh, not only with our local peers but with other students in other parts of the world uh, and and make that integral part of our learning experience uh, maybe i'm dreaming but i i like dreaming well, thank you. Thank you, Wim. We, I'm certain that all of us are dreaming uh, and that this is what makes uh, us moving forward because only our dreams uh, can make us uh, do something better than uh, we already have. So thank you. So Francesca, you are the, the last one, but not least. So your, your final words. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming and optimistic, but I, I, I don't want to be too cynical, but I, th I think I think we've massive steps have been made. So we've kind of overcome the technological barrier. As Wim said, you know, e-learning is normal. We, we can take that for granted. I, I don't think we can take for granted though that that we will have students collaborating, um, that they, you know, that they will be involved because it does require a lot of work on the part of the teachers. And this isn't recognized. And a lot of universities, and Levin is, is different. I saw your, you know, you have fantastic support systems in place, but uh, you know, we don't have um, I don't know, learning designers who help us design and plan our courses. What I'd really like to see in place is universities investing, not just in the technology, but in investing in staff to support us in planning our collaborative courses so that they really become collaborative in practice and not just on, on paper. I've seen a lot of institutional collaborations. And I think even, I don't want to be cynical about the university, European University Alliances, but I think that, you know, on paper, they seem to be collaborating, but I don't know how many students are actually benefiting from these interactions. I've seen joint programs where, you know, it's the two or three students who have the mobility. They have the joint program, but none of the stu other students experience it as a joint program at all. So what I'd really like to see is joint programs being really joint program where every student in the degree courses that have joined actually have interactions with the students in the other university where it's joined. So, you know, but this, it needs, um, it needs support. It needs, we can't always, you know, rely on teachers who are overworked, we're understaffed, and we have increasingly, you know, teachers on precarious contracts. So I think, you know, the university needs to invest in this um, so it can work from a bottom up and a top down perspective. Thank you, Francesca. Yes, um, we need to conclude as we have passed already the time, but it was such interesting and such uh, uh, excellent webinar. I have learned really a lot. And uh, uh, I hope that the recordings uh, will be uh, watched uh, by a number of people because uh, such good examples of practice and uh, guidance and, and uh, uh, advices uh, given in these webinars are really, really of uh, uh, great uh, importance. So I wish to thank all the speakers uh, for to 
for, for being today and for joining the webinar. I wish to thank the attendees, the participants for being with us. This is the last webinar in this training part within the Child in Central Asia Education. So uh, I hope that projects finish well and that you have the good results. Uh, and it may be some another occasions to see you all again by then. Bye and stay safe. Bye. Thank you Bye. very much, Sandra. And thank you very much to the speakers. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.